Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. We're going to kick off this uh, compelling program with our ongoing series, Research, Science, Innovation, and Leadership, done in cooperation with the great folks at Kessler Foundation. Mary, this is exciting. Why don't you introduce our good friend, Roger? Oh, I would love it. Roger DeRose is a great friend, and he is also the president and CEO of the Kessler Foundation. And Roger, thank you so much for being here. And most importantly, thank you so much for being such a generous and a great sponsor to have of Steve Adubato's Lessons in Leadership with co-host me, Mary Gamba. Thank Mary. you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's, it's, you know what? It's the Lessons in Leadership with Steve and Mary. I don't like the idea that I'm the major player and you're this backup that i don't like that i'm going to change our logo immediately following the show steve it'll just be with steve and mary <laughs> I, I agree and enough about us roger listen roger put in context we're about to see olga and peggy uh, set up who they are they're great researchers great scientists great leaders talk about them and set up what we're about to see well first of all thank you steve and mary for having us uh, back on your show and with your viewers it's uh, terrific to be here and talking about leadership in the type of research that we conduct at Kessler Foundation. And today, you know, your, your viewers are gonna be able to meet Dr. Peggy Chen, one of our uh, senior research scientists, as well as Dr. Olga Okrina, who uh, is one of our, our, our senior scientists as well. And we're, we're just delighted that they are working in one of the major areas, uh, which is the Stroke Center for rehabilitation research, Steve and Mary. And, and, and I say that because, you know, there's 800,000 strokes a year just in the United States alone. And the types of deficits and functional issues that people with strokes have can be mobility related, they can be uh, cognitive related. And what you're gonna hear today from Olga and Peggy is in the area of the work that we do in the, the, the field of cognition related to the brain. Olga specializes in the um, uh, work of brain damage following a stroke, and uh, this has to do with reading deficits. Peggy works in the area of spatial neglect so that when one side of the brain is damaged in a stroke, that there becomes this field of uh, spatial neglect is what it's called, where the GPS system of the brain is mm -hmm. not actually picking up all elements of space. And through the research that Peggy's doing, we, through 10 sessions, 10 one-hour sessions, we can help individuals regain that lost function that they had from the stroke. So this is a very exciting area and it's so meaningful, Steve and Mary, because we implement this by going right into the, the, the practice at Kessler Institute and we go around the world with our research and share it so that these can be used in clinical practices, which is so important. Hmm. Roger, before I let you go and before we move into this segment with Olga and Peggy, the website has been up the entire time for Kessler Foundation no money, no mission. And we, we are not shy about saying, listen, we want to support the work of the foundation. So if people want to contribute and or find out more, tell folks when they go on that website how they can give to the research being done, please. Yeah, please have them come to KesslerFoundation.org and uh, they can learn more about our foundation and the mission. But you know, their funding is really what helps us collect the early data that we need in order to then apply for some of the major grants at the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense and other agencies. And it's so important, Steve. And our scientists, we are so lucky to have world-class scientists right here in New Jersey that are competing on the world stage at NIH, Department of Defense and other agencies and able to win many of those very, very significant grants, but we can't do it without donor support that comes from your viewers, Steve. Well said. So we're about to uh, meet two extraordinary researchers, scientists at Kessler Foundation. I wanna thank Roger, uh, the folks at the foundation for this partnership on research, innovation, science, and leadership. It is all about leadership. Uh, we'll have Roger on again in the future because Roger and I have so many offline conversations <laughs> about leadership that are not really research or science related. It's just like, Wow, isn't it being hard being a leader and also very gratifying. Roger, okay. thank you, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mary. Great to be with you. You got it. Stay with us. You can check out some good stuff right now.
We talked about them before and we are honored to have them with us on Lessons in Leadership. Um, Dr. Peggy Chen is Senior Research Scientist and Intellectual Property Liaison Kessler Foundation and Research Associate Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Rutgers, New Jersey School of Medicine. Dr. Olga uh, Bukrina. Olga, I got that right. You did. Olga Bukrina is in fact a research scientist, Center for Stroke Rehabilitation Research at Kessler Foundation. It's great to have you both with us on Lessons in Leadership. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You know, Roger set this up talking about exactly what you, the work, work you're doing, the research you're doing and why it matters. Um, and we just finished a seminar series, both of you together, uh, that we led with a group of great scientists at Kessler Foundation. Peggy, let me ask you, you're a scientist and a researcher, but have you always seen yourself as a leader? That's a big question. Um, and I see myself as a leader now, probably 20 years ago, I probably did not see myself as a leader. I was just started in my career. I was a student and learning how to do research. And slowly I built my own research lines and I've become more confident leading the field as I grow. Olga, again, the series Research, Science, Innovation, and Leadership. Um, born leader on your end or a leader that has grown into who you are today? I think I'll echo uh, Peggy in saying that it's a work in progress um, and it's always um, you learn something, um, you acquire some new skills. Uh, but as scientists, I think um, we have to be able to lead and to take people on this journey um, that describes our ideas, where they come from, where they lead. Um, so you have to be able to learn this important skill. Mm. And in terms of being a leader in the area of research, Olga, talk specifically about the research you're doing and the impact it's having. Um, so I study people who have a stroke in the left side of their brain. Uh, that often leads to prob problems with language and reading. And these people often have problems in multiple domains of language. Um, and also in terms of uh, their brain, um, the cerebral blood flow and brain activity in their brain is reduced on that side of the brain where they had the stroke. Um, and what we're doing is studying um, what happens when people first have a stroke and what occurs when they have uh, recovery, full or incomplete recovery. And then we're also trying to develop new tools um, that will target their specific areas um, where they need help um, and also um, target brain processes. Um, we're trying to uh, help these people to improve their function after stroke. Yeah. And before Mary jumps back in, let me ask you, Peggy, spatial neglect, define it and help us understand it. This disorder called spatial neglect um, is a symptom, a deficit, because of people's function of attention was damaged after brain injury. And the population that I'm working with, their brain injury is mostly caused by stroke. And um, spatial neglect, why it is called neglect is because after the brain injury, they lost ability to pay attention to space. And that space is uh, has particularly important to um, our body and environment relationship. So it's not like they cannot see or perceive things around them if they're not paying attention to the space that's actually opposite to their brain injury. Complex and important stuff. Mary, jump in. Yeah, definitely. Olga, can you talk a little bit? We often talk about no money, no mission, and I've said it on the series <laughs> so many times. And at the Kessler Foundation, obviously, in order to do the research and the things that you do to truly impact people's lives, for the viewers that are watching today, what is needed? What does the Kessler Foundation need in order to continue to move forward on these, on these very important studies and treatments for people? So we can create the novel solutions and we can come up with the creative ideas, but without the leadership from the community, none of this work uh, would be able to proceed. So it would just remain ideas on paper. We do need um, you know, our volunteers that are part of our research and our sponsors that make this research possible. And uh, there's many projects that only became possible after someone stepped up to the leadership role and said, I wanna make this possible. I believe in this project. It's funny to talk about leadership. We're also talking about this. 
<laughs> fundraising, development. Peggy, talk about that. I asked you if you saw yourself as a leader. Do you see yourself, I don't want to say as a fundraiser, but Roger and I were actually just having, uh, Roger DeRose and I were just having an offline conversation about this. Every researcher and scientist tied to Kessler Foundation, if you are not good at bringing in grants, bringing in dollars, that's what Mary means, no money, no mission. Peggy, have you always seen yourself as someone who has to convince others to sign on board and say, yes, we're gonna support this financially, Peggy? Yes, that's a huge part of our job. And uh, so we, we do two different approaches. One is more conventional way, uh, like most research universities, we submit grants uh, either to the federal government, to state government to help us uh, continue our research or, or create new, uh, initiate new research projects. We also work with uh, our uh, local communities, uh, like a private foundation or certain families if they're interested in our research. And during this process, we're not, uh, I, don't, I don't see myself as a, a fundraiser, but I work with the um, um, people in the foundation who are really good at yeah, fundraising. Yeah, with Michelle, Michelle Pignatello yes, and exactly. that team, right? So, and so what Olga and I, we can do is to communicate with the community organizations and help them understand why our project is not just helping people they don't know, but also themselves and their families, why it is important, why they can really improve everybody's quality of life. So, and that is a big component. Sorry, Mary. Yeah, no, and Olga, you know, when with the pandemic, we're almost two years into this, we're taping this now in November of 2021, it'll be aired in January and repeated. What was the biggest challenge that you faced? I mean, for many of us, we were able to be at home and work from home, uh, but for, for medical professionals and others advancing research, what was the biggest challenge that you faced in your field uh, given the, the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, as the foundation, we worked from home for several months in 2020. Um, and that meant that we couldn't recruit patients into our research because at the time, a lot of our research was conducted in person. Um, so that was a big challenge that we, a lot of the work had to be put on hold. Um, on the other hand, it also gave us an opportunity to catch up on some other things such as, you know, writing up the results of the findings that we were already uh, we've already analyzed and completed um, and, and publishing it, uh, that work uh, so that people can read it. Um, and also give us the opportunity to think in new ways about conducting our research and, and um, thinking about making it more mobile and more uh, uh, versatile in terms of taking it to um, a platform such as Zoom. So I know, I, I think Peggy um, has a study that's uh, uh, running uh, online. Talk about yes, that, Peggy. and uh, Olga really um, touched on a very good point. So the challenge actually help us um, innovate, uh, help, help us create new ways uh, to conduct study. And actually, um, for me, uh, I started new research lines using mobile devices. Uh, I'm using virtual reality, augmented reality devices that's using uh, Wi-Fi connection. So we're developing treatment uh, studies that eventually, hopefully in the next few years can be used at patients' homes. So all these are triggered by, um, I would not say it's triggered by the pandemic, but the pandemic situation actually accelerated the development of using mobile devices to create new treatment and eventually for in the future, hopefully to improve home-based services. What a great example of innovation and its connection. That is leadership. That's leading in your field. That's leading and making a difference in people's lives and quality of life. This is a question I've been wanting to ask both of you because we work together in the seminar series and I learned so much about you and your colleagues, which, uh, and we were blessed to be able to do it in person, which was great. But, but Peggy and, and, and Olga, I wanna ask both of you. In science, when I think science, I think also math in this sense, because I struggled uh, in math. I was a qualitative person uh, in my research, mostly because quantitatively I was terrible. In math, two plus two always equals four. Science, two plus two equals four. In leadership, um, Olga, two plus two doesn't always equal four. What I mean by that is, is leadership is a science of sorts, but it's also an art form. Is that challenging or how is that challenging for someone who 
is trained in the field of science to realize that leadership isn't so neat and clean. And I'm not saying science is, but it's, it's an art. Is that complex for you? Um, I agree with that statement, Steve, that um, in science, oftentimes um, the large breakthroughs, the kind of uh, the innovative ideas, they come not from a single head, but from people putting many heads together and bringing their expertise to the table. So, um, you know, someone that's good in math and statistics and, and uh, complex analysis and, uh, uh, you know, machine learning um, can bring this expertise to the table. And then somebody who's more creatively um, assessing the situation and the problem at hand can, can uh, put that to the table as well. And so together they give birth to something that's, that's more creative and, and bigger than any one of them individually could have created. So nowadays the emphasis is on teams and, um, you know, uh, Peggy and I have a good example where we where actually bring our interests together in many projects and, and collaborate and uh, create new um, ideas and studies. Yeah. Peggy, uh, real quick, uh, leadership as a combination of science and art, you say? It definitely is art. Even science is kind of an art, uh, like how to how to answer questions, like uh, to find a solution, to ask, to answer scientific questions. It's, I would say it's our form and uh, leadership def definitely, um, um, because we are, we're working with people. When there's people, there's dynamics and uh, uh, there's, I would say not all stop, like there's no one style of leadership that can work in all situations in all kinds of like, different teams. And in our setting, we're a hybrid of uh, corporate culture and the science culture. So, so we learn these so-called soft skills, you know, while we're you know, in the position. So we're, I think both of us yeah. are learning how to work with our teams and lead our team. And actually we also educate new scientists um, all the time. So it's really a great opportunity for us. As soon as you bring the human element into it, it isn't so black and white, two and two never equals simply four. Olga and Peggy, it is not just an honor to have you on with us on Lessons in Leadership and be part of the Research, Science, Innovation, and Leadership series that made possible by for our partnership with Kessler Foundation, but it's been an honor to work with both of you in the classroom setting, and I continue, look forward to continuing to learning from each other. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Olga. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Steve. And Mary. Mary our pleasure. We'll be right back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. We are honored to be joined by Warwick Fairfax, who is founder of Crucible Leadership. Um, Warwick comes to us from our good friends at the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, our partners there. This book, Crucible Leadership, we'll put it up there, we'll tell you about it, but I have to tell you in reading it, compelling, fascinating, raw, candid, vulnerable, all of it. Um, first of all, it is an honor, Mr. Fairfax, to have you join us. Well, thanks so much, Steve, and thanks, Mary. It's wonderful to be here. The premise of the book talks about being resilient, coming back from a very public 
I don't like to use the word failure, if you will, that you talk about a $2.25 billion family owned business, 150 years old. You take it over at what age? It's hard to believe I was 27 when this happened. Take a look. I'm looking at you. You're 27, you said? Yeah. And describe the different platforms and the, the, how you get to a $2.25 billion empire. What's in there? Well, yeah, thanks, Steve. So I grew up in this 150-year-old family media business. It had the Australian equivalent of the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, massive company, 4,000 uh, employees, 700 million in revenue. It was massive. So uh, yeah, fresh out of Harvard Business School, my dad died earlier in 87 when this happened. And I felt the company wasn't being run along the ideals of the founder or wasn't being managed well. Whether that's true or not, in my youthful naivety and uh, idealism, I went in there with this crusader mentality and uh, I inherited some shares, so that made it possible. So I launched this $2.25 billion takeover, which, you know, I was full of idealism, but um, it basically failed spectacularly for a variety of reasons. So it was just, you know, sort of you know, young man, a lot of idealism, uh, but you know, just a cataclysmic failure on sort of an epic scale. And the spirit of lessons in leadership, all about, if you will send you a copy of my book, Lessons in Leadership, because it's filled with my mistakes and failures uh, of every level. Lessons that we learn from them. One significant lesson you learned from that experience that everyone can appreciate would be, go ahead. You know, it might not be what you would expect. It felt a bit like growing up in the royal family, like Prince William or even, you know, Prince Harry, who's had a pretty tough time. So I had inherited this whole um, mantle, if you will. So I went to Oxford, like some of my relatives, worked on Wall Street, went to Harvard, Harvard Business School, I got my MBA. So really, I was trying to live somebody else's life, some... Uh, you know, media mogul, if you will, but at heart, I'm more of a reserved, reflective advisor. So the biggest mistake I made, which were, were many, but the biggest was I was trying to be somebody else. You know, bad things happen when you try to live somebody else's life, even if it's a noble legacy. You know, we were respected by the community. Uh, we were seen as producing independent newspapers. There was a lot to admire about the vision of the company, but as good a vision as it was, it wasn't my vision. I was living somebody else's life. Mary. Yeah. And you talk a lot in the book about uh, a path to significance. Can you share what that means? Uh, that resonated with me and I'm confident our viewers it will resonate with them as well. Yeah. I mean, I define a life of significance as a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. So it's sort of my premise that everybody wants to be joyful and fulfilled. Well, given the way humans are wired, which we can't do a whole lot about, if you focus on some narcissistic, it's all about me and wealth and money, and this is not so much a value judgment. It's about, you know, we can't do much about being human. It doesn't lead to being fulfilled. You could talk to any psychologist. They'll tell you narcissism and just focusing on self is not the way. And so for me, you know, a life, especially out of the ashes of a crucible that will give you joy and fulfillment is to try to find pain and the purpose to use that aphorism, try to find a way to give back. So when you focus on others, you know, you can be successful and joyful and fulfilled if you're really focused on somehow giving back. And in, it sounds idealistic, but in your own way, be a big or small, making the world a better place. The title, make it, make it resonate for everyone watching right now, Crucible Leadership. Talk about it. So yeah, Steve, so really a crucible is a gut-wrenching, painful experience. It could be your fault or not your fault. So we have our own uh, podcast, Beyond the Crucible. We've interviewed 70 plus guests, everybody from um, every gender, race, background. People have become quadriplegics. People have been abused. People have lost businesses. Um, all of those are, are just traumatic experiences. And so a crucible uh, is such that you're never the same uh, after you go through a crucible. And so really, crucible leadership comes from when you go through a crucible, you have a choice. You can say this was unfair or I, what I did was just awful and hide under the covers for the next 30, 40 years or 50 years. Eventually it will end. Or you can say this was awful. It wasn't fair, but how do I use my pain to help others? Right. Exactly. It really, that. it starts with the inside. You've got to 
deal with that. But so a crucible, you know, it's often, you know, the worst day in your life, but how do you bounce back from that? And that's really the key. And you could lead on a massive level or just in your neighborhood or community. It's really, it, it's a choice. It's that defining moment. Are you going to let it defeat you that's and right. destroy you? Or are you going to try to bounce back stronger? By the way, as we put up uh, the Bucino Leadership Institute, Seton Hall University, you have in fact written for In the Lead, which we've contributed to as well, which is a leadership publication put out by the Bucino Leadership Institute. You've been on with Brian Price, our great friend, the director up there at the Institute on their podcast. But real quick, crucible moment, Mary and I have talked about this before. I didn't know Mary um, when I lost my seat in the state legislature in New Jersey at 27. You, mm. you, you. Mm -hmm. You lost a few bucks at 27. <laughs> yeah. I lost I lost what I thought was my lifelong dream to be governor and God knows what at 27. And I remember thinking, this is unfair. I was better. And someone said to me, my a very close friend, God rest his soul, hey, you want to complain about the election saying it was unfair or do you want to figure out how you can make a difference in another arena? And that's why we're actually here today. That's That's the rest of the story all these years later. Mary, I'll give you another shot. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. So one minute or less, if you had some advice to give to our young adults, say at Seton Hall at the Bacino Leadership Institute, in terms of resilience that you were talking about, can you share a tip or tool on how to truly be resilient and bounce back? I'd say your worst day doesn't define you. Probably the most important thing is, yes, you need friends that will help you, but you've got to dig down deep into your values and beliefs. It could be a religion, philosophy, but you know, when life is at its toughest, dig down deep in what is it I believe in? And I am, and just say to yourself, I refuse to be defined by what happened. Uh, I will find a purpose in this. We've had people on our podcast that have, a, a woman that was, became a quadriplegic at age 12 and a, uh, you know, diving accident in a pool. She says what she went through is a gift. I don't pretend to understand that, but if you can somehow find some sense of purpose, in your worst moment, that does give you resilience to get through often what's unthinkable. So dig deep within is probably the first step. And by the way, this book is filled with stories of people who have been incredibly resilient as they face their crucible moment. I wanna re remind folks, go on to web our website, stand-deliver.com. Look at, I've said it many times, Mary, look at our interview with the great Eric Legrand, um, paralyzed in a football game playing for Rutgers back in 2010. He chose to say, I'm going to make a difference. And that's what he's doing today in his crucible moment. Uh, Rorick, I want to thank you so much for joining us. You honor us by being with us. Um, we appreciate our friends at Seton Hall University and the Bucino Leadership Institute, because one of the great things about the partnership is they connect us to people we otherwise might not know. Hey, all the best to you and your family. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Mary. And this has been Lessons in Leadership. And we'll see you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.